So uh, very quickly, I'm just going to say a couple of words just to say thank you very much at the start of this to Fernanda. And um, we really appreciate you doing this for us. And what I've really appreciated is that Fernanda and the New Economics Foundation were, um, were running this project and they approached us and said, perhaps we could do some of this work within the pioneer area. And that was wonderful for us because the pioneer has been um, made up of projects which haven't been internally funded. They've been funded by people who have come to, um, who, who are, are thinking along the same lines of the pioneer and interested in exploring things uh, that might lead to better outcomes for nature and for people. And um, it was really great to have this kind of a project working within a pioneer area so that we could present some of these results. The work that NEF are doing is really, really interesting in this crossover between what's important about nature and what's important about people being engaged with and involved with and helping to make decisions about what happens to nature. And so I just want to say thanks very much, Fernanda, for working alongside us and for um, presenting your work. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Um, yeah, thank you for having me um, do one of these webinars. Um, I think it's very exciting that NMO is doing this. Um, and yeah, we're very happy to contribute. Um, I will talk about the case study um, towards the end of the presentation, but I'll just go through the rationale why um, we're talking about coastal community resi resilience. Um, but first, let me share my screen with you. <laughs> And while you're doing that, I'll just mention that feel free, for those of you who have been on these webinars before, you know that feel free to write your questions during the presentation and we will we'll get to them towards the end. But also that um, if you have anything to say, just raise your hand and I'll be keeping an eye on everybody so that if anybody wants to say anything that we can, we can uh, try and address that as we go. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just having a little trouble sharing my screen. <laughs> see if it works now. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> I think it works. So yeah, just to say that my name is Fernanda, um, Ashley introduced us, but um, I'm a senior researcher and program manager for the Environment and Green Transition team at NAF. And just a quick intro to NAF, in case you haven't heard of it, the New Economics Foundation. Um, firstly, we work in partnership with a range of um, actors um, in society to develop policy and practical solutions and build the power needed towards a new economy that works for people and the planet. So really coming from the, the um, starting point that this economy, economic system is not working. Um, we have a coastal economies program since 2015. Um, I have been leading on that program since the beginning with the Blue New Deal project for coastal communities um, that some of you probably have heard about, I've probably talked to you about. Um, in essence, that project is um, talking about a vision and um, an action plan to deliver more and better jobs, climate and economic resilience, and a healthier coastal and marine environment, all at the same time. And relevant to this webinar today, um, we're working with a coastal management project in the Suffolk Marine Pioneer area since 2018, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So just on what this webinar is about, I'll be just talking about some of the barriers um, that we um, think are still <laughs> limiting the delivery of the 25 year environment plan and its ambition. <laughs> we'll be proposing um, coastal community resilience as a key outcome for coastal management projects and then suggesting some ideas for how projects can tackle those barriers 
from the outset to deliver community resilience. So I just thought I outlined the uh, pioneers broad objectives um, as a reminder. Um, so uh, the projects have been requested to apply a natural capital approach to decision making, to develop innovative funding opportunities, to demonstrate integrated approaches to planning and delivery, and importantly for us in terms of what we're looking at, um, building our understanding of what works in practice. Um, so really that focus on, you know, beyond the, the theory or what's been written in policy, but really what happens on the ground. And just looking at the um, final report um, that was released in 2018, um, I think on the pioneers, um, the kind of broad outcomes and impacts that they've been um, trying to inform um, around protection of natural capital for more informed decision making, restoration and enhancement of natural capital through enhanced and better targeted investment, and broader environmental action. Now, with the ultimate goal that we have a natural environment that is improved within a generation. So, why community resilience? Um, in, in, at the end of 2018, um, the uh, Com Committee on Climate Change uh, Adaptation Committee report uh, looked at the approach to coastal management in the English, English coast um, and concluded that it's not fit for purpose. The key findings from that report um, talked about how coastal communities, infrastructure and landscapes already face threats. So the acknowledgement that, you know, this is already happening, but it would only increase in the future. That the problem is not being confronted with the required urgency or openness. Um, we know that some hard decisions will need to be made on the coast about what gets protected, what doesn't, what gets transformed and how. And the sustainable coast adaptation is possible and could deliver multiple benefits. However, it requires a long term commitment and proactive steps to inform and facilitate change in social attitudes. Now, most recently in February this year, there was a joint letter by um, the CCC's Adaptation Committee, the National Infrastructure Commission and Ferg Ray, <laughs> basically recommending to government that we move from narrow concept of protection to a broader one of resilience. And I know for everyone in this call that has been working um, in these issues for a long time, that's, that's not really um, a new finding, but it's really good to see um, those ideas being pushed uh, more and more. And obviously we know the urgency um, and the, uh, how we're facing so many multiple crises. Um, it's important that we, we really get on um, to move into the resilience concept. Um, also, the Environment um, Agency um, uh, um, has released a new strategy or, or is working on a new strategy and looking at national resilience standard. This latter, by um, this joint latter, uh, outlined some of this, um, talking about how a national resilience standard would ensure that society as a whole is better off with benefits exceeding costs. Um, the national resilience standards are affordable in line with the fiscal remit for economic infrastructure set by HM Treasury. And that importantly, that it takes a place based resilience approach according to need rather than the current situation that limits adaptation options. So I just highlighted some of those, um, some of that analysis. I'm talking about the benefits of the national resilience standards. Um, but these ones in particular, outlining how it would be actable, a nationally con consistent approach to setting standards, avoids a resilience postcode lottery, reduces regional inequality in flood and coastal expenditure, and help with the transition to an affordable, risk reflective home insurance market when flood rate support ends in 2039. Empower local communities so people in places at risk would be engaged in the process of selecting and applying tools to achieve resilience in the communities, i.e. not one size fits all. And support adaptation to climate change so local places would co-develop 
the adaptation response to manage future flooding, coastal change, and climate risks. So I'm outlining all these things because um, obviously it's not just NAFTA has been looking at these things <laughs> by all means. Um, this is all out there and um, all these words and, and, and those um, recommendations are very strong. Um, and you know what we, as to remember from the beginning uh, of the presentation, what we're interested in is how are these things being implemented in practice and what are the barriers? So the final document that I'll, I'll share um, is the Community Resilience Development Framework. Um, so government, the, the government framework on community, community resilience development outlines a broader understanding of community resilience, which supports the case for a more holistic approach to natural resource management and investment that makes community resilience a priority outcome. So what the framework says is that community resilience is all about working with civil society to create social value and achieve a more resilient UK. This is vital for emergencies, but these principles are also relevant across the whole spectrum of public service delivery. The civil society strategy from 2018, building a future that works for everyone, outlines key principles around working with civil society to create social value. And the principles outlined in the strategy are the same ones that underpin community resilience. Also in the framework, it talks about how emergency resilience activity should be aligned with more general resilience building activity and vice versa. And it also connects um, with the industrial strategy that identifies places, prosperous communities across the UK as one of the five foundations of productivity. So moving on from what's there and, and what's already being proposed and um, how the knowledge um, and experience that we have and, and the way that we think this thing should be pushed forward. Um, I just want to take us to a, a diff diff different um, piece of evidence or analysis on local participation and how it happens. So, um, this ladder of citizen participation um, for, by Arnstein time is a very useful um, way um, to look at the different levels of um, local participation that projects um, usually take. Um, and you can see that it goes from non-participation to the tokenism um, to citizen power. And I would argue that, you know, we are um, interested in in, in going up the ladder um, and delivering ever um, more partnership, delegated power and citizen control. But we know that in practice, um, currently for many different reasons, um, that's not how we, how it works. And we tend to be stuck on the tokenism um, uh, steps. Another useful um, typology of participation is um, this one by um, Pretty, adapted from Pretty, Satter White, and Edmund et al. Hart. Um, I got a source there at the bottom. So this looks at how people participate in development programs and projects. Um, and it has seven different um, uh, categorizations. Now I'm highlighting interactive participation as um, the one that we should be um, moving towards or that it's that, that it is possible um, to be implemented now within projects but it's not happening um, some things need to change but that that should be an achievable goal and interactive participation talks about how people participate in the joint analysis development of action plans and formation of strengthening of local institutions participation is seen as a right not just a means to achieve project goals the process involves interdisciplinary methodologies that seek multiple perspectives and make use of systemic and structural learning processes. As groups take control over local decisions and determine how available resources are used, so they have a stake in maintaining structures or practices. Now, I think um, many projects now obviously are aiming for that. And to a certain extent, um, some of this is achieved. But 
the, the framework really in terms of the tools, the resources, um, the level of investment in terms of uh, money and time, and also barriers um, around um, like cultural barriers or uh, um, uh, you know the fact that people have have had consultation fatigue and and many other barriers um, beyond just resources um, at a local level in terms of participation um, limit the the possibility of actually um, doing effective interactive participation currently. So what do we know? What do we do now? Um, so I put like three scenarios um, and just to uh, remember that my presentation and talking about community um, resilience as an outcome, um, I'm focusing very much on coastal management projects, although uh, many of these ideas I, I, I know can be um, taken to projects more broadly on the coast or, um, or marine projects. But um, I just want to keep focus on the coastal, coastal management project. So what do we do now? So three scenarios. We can spend millions of pounds on a defense approach, um, seawalls, for example, to protect an area's economy and homes in the short term and leave them with no resources and even more vulnerable in the medium to long term, mounting the costs and lives impacted. We can spend millions of pounds to protect few people's interests and land but not deliver for the community, which could have environmental um, outcomes, positive environmental outcomes, or we can push current approaches further and ensure that any money spent now is creating the greatest benefit to more equal communities and increasing their resilience for the future. Now, I imagine a lot of people wouldn't disagree <laughs> that scenario three would be more desirable. Um, but and i know that it's not just a simple yes we want that one um let's just do it um so just we'll explore a little bit more of some of the barriers but importantly what we do now matters um projects are now an intergenerational decision and especially in the context of the crisis that we're living now um with covid and the impact on the economy the impact on people's lives, the impact on um, behavior, I mean, the, the impact across really um, society um, means that um, we, we, that, that, that um, path that we were going that already required uh, a, a huge level of investment in um, restructuring so we could move towards a post-carbon society. Um, has been compounded really um, by this new crisis. And so it's, it's ever more important that whatever resources we, we use now and how they use it are used the right way um, because it's, it's likely to be um, a one in a lifetime opportunity really to get it right. And we know that there are lots of things that we need to get right. So yeah, we need to make the right decisions with the right people at the table. We can't avoid um, or um, leave that as an afterthought anymore. Environmental impact of how we manage the coast is now locked in for a generation or more. Obviously, if you do a managed realignment scheme or um, other, other, other types of coastal management solutions on the coast now, um, it's a huge amount of um, investment that's needed and time that takes to, to do it. So we, we need to be making the right choice. Um, there won't be the same level of investment anytime soon. So barrier number one, um, the majority of projects at the moment are not equipped or required to address some of the fundamental barriers for sustainable environmental protection. And that includes addressing, for example, the inequalities of power, power um, in terms of resources, power in terms of representation. Um, <coughs> and many other. The second barrier, sustainable natural resource management must become a higher priority than delivering short-term economic growth, acknowledging that healthy and well-functioning systems are prerequisites for social and economic prosperity, as well as tackling the climate crisis. So in light of those barriers, there are some key issues to address. Um, 
the level and quality of local participation, which is um, some of the things I've been focusing on in looking at the ladders of participation, the transparency of power and ownership structures, um, which I haven't touched on as much, but um, I think it's the biggest challenge really and the biggest barrier in terms of projects, and I'll explain that in a minute. The development of local industrial strategies. So this is linking to the issues around how you know the uh, economic drivers are still dominant in terms of how we develop and how we lead projects um, and uh, uh, local industrial strategies will have to um, will have to tackle those issues um, if we want to deliver social environmental and, and, and economic outcomes together um, but also importantly is that you know, that's linked to the level and quality of local participation because the opportunity to do local industrial strategies is that you can do a place-based approach. Um, it's more inclusive. And making all finance incentives green and socially fair, which I won't go into in my presentation, but we know that finance, is, um, finance reform is a huge part of this in terms of investment in nature um, and unleashing the resources to do other types of activities too in terms of social outcomes. So the first uh, proposal is um, that plans to manage, protect, or restore coastal marine ecosystems must be designed from the outside to deliver coastal community resilience. These plans must be seen as, and in effect be, an opportunity to deliver wide local economic, social, and environmental benefit, and they must be co-owned by the community and the local authority. The second proposal is that um, to deliver the first greater investment in the prioritization of time and resources to secure and enable the interactive participation of local people can produce much better and broader outcomes and impact. And the third one is that investment in nature must achieve a balance between both ecological and socioeconomic needs and structures, narratives and policies at the regional, national and international level will also need to change to support and enable local efforts. Now that's broadly um, the changes that, that we think need to happen. Um, but in terms of a way forward, um, I want to try and focus on what can be done at a project level now, or, it, or which, what we should be, how we should be pushing projects now um, further. So I said I, I talked about the inequalities of power. Um, addressing current inequalities of power in a place is a fundamental part of building social value, community wealth, and resilience. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the case study. If you look um, at many locations, um, uh, the ownership of land um, dictates, um, so, so the, the owners of land um, tends to be, you know, the, the immediate stakeholders, for example, in a, in a, in a negotiation about what might happen um, in an area in terms of management. Um, communities, uh, it, it, it's harder to engage um, communities and um, that creates an inequality of, of voices and interests. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in the case study. But um, so I'm saying set community resilience as broadly understood by um, the government's community resilience development framework as a mandatory outcome of plans and projects to manage, protect, or restore coastal marine ecosystems and create a framework and dedicate a budget to enable projects to bring local people together through interactive participation. And just to say, there are three broad objectives that we outline of interactive participation. Um, and this goes in line with, um, you know, a, a, a push in recent times and um, a lot more investment into doing um, citizens assemblies and um, citizens juries um, that used um, informed deliberation processes. So beyond the current level of economic assessments and considerations, um, early project development must be facilitated also based on transparent information on distributional cost and benefit flows, including social outcomes related to well-being, ownership and access. 
So we know that a lot of the economic analysis that are done for projects are very um, uh, uh, top level. Um, they don't tend to go into more details um, into how um, costs are distributed, how costs will be distributed and how benefits are distributed locally. Um, but also, you know, who owns what and um, who has access and, and, and um, well-being benefits. So we're saying that the information, interactive participation requires more transparent um, and more um, local relevant information. Justice, so how can we maximize greater social justice through the financing model and engagement process should be an explicit and fundamental question posed for each project. Um, and I would argue from my experience that that's not normally the case, um, not in practical terms, um, you know, although many people care about issues of social justice, that's not something that projects tend to try to address. And the final one is co-designed coastal marine social and economic plans. So promote, support, and equip community leadership to design and propose a coastal marine social and economic plan that combines ecological needs with the location-specific knowledge and aspirations of communities themselves, which is some of the things we've been trying to do through our Blue Do project with um, different communities. Now, I know that there's loads of plans out there and that there are communities that are trying to um, do more holistic plans like that. But crucially, um, these plans do not yet have the legitimacy within the formal processes of local economic plans by local authorities and local enterprise partnerships, and that would need to change. So I'll just end on the Suffolk case study. Um, so I don't know um, if anyone is familiar with it, but um, the name of the project is the Bannock and Castingland Flood Risk Management Project. And local partners are being convened and led by the Water Management Alliance East and East Suffolk Council, but there's a range of different um, um, organizations um, working together in the area. Um, and it's located within the Suffolk Marine Pioneer area. So Casting Land near Lowestoft um, is home to the privately owned Menneker Estate, which covers six kilometers of Suffolk's 80 kilometer coast. And several acres of this land is lost to flooding and coastal erosion every year. Currently, public money is being used to support hard defenses that protect the pumping station, which is keeping the land dry artificially. But this is no longer a sustainable nor cost effective solution, and it creates problems elsewhere as the sea is instead forced to wash north and south. Casting land is in the bottom 30% of local areas by the index of multiple deprivation. This is driven mostly strongly by childhood deprivation. Child poverty um, was higher in 2015 compared to a national average. And it also, Kettingland also has above average rates of older people in deprivation compared to the national average. Um, so local partners in Kettingland have been pushing a project to look to do, manage realign, to do a managed realignment scheme. Um, as an alternative approach to coastal management in the area. And we started working with them to look at how um, we could bring socioeconomic relevance and input to what tends to be a more technical um, environment like discussion and the project. Um, and inclu we included in the early um, conversations uh, questions about the financing models, um, how could different financing models um, be best at delivering benefits to the local communities. Um, you know, local money, uh, public money is currently being invested in an area that has private land ownership, um, but you have um, uh, uh, deprived communities in the area that not only are not able to properly engage in that process, but also um, there isn't really um, a lot of a lot being done to. Uh, uh, to, to understand what the benefits to those communities would be beyond, of course, the overall benefit of having a, um, a better managed coastal um, habitat. Um, so we are doing local economic analysis for the project, looking at distributional costs and benefit flows, including social outcomes related to well-being, ownership and access. And improving 
improving the way we understand how benefits flow from these kind of schemes um, is ever more important now. Um, you know, COVID, if, if we can say there was, there's been a, a, a positive um, take from it is that the importance of access to nature, the importance of um, the, the links between nature and well-being and health. Um, and, you know, as we face the climate crisis and environmental crisis, we're hoping that a, a fiscal stimulus that will be uh, coming during a recovery phase will have a great focus on nature restoration. So really bringing to the fore the, those kind of benefits from these kind of projects now is ever more important. In 2020, so we were just actually on the phone with them this morning, um, as we've had to be really patient, um, not, not us, not NAF, but um, obviously uh, the project, the local partners, everyone had, had to be really patient with, um, you, you know, you, you guys probably know better than me how these projects go on the ground. You know, it takes time to get everything together. Um, and obviously the crisis hitting. Um, and I think there's been some um, uh, adjust, uh, uh, changes to policy, government policy as well. So um, the project is responding to all that. But we have agreed to start um, now conversations with local people about the current situation um, and what they, would, what they would like to see. And we want to try and quantify the benefits of access to green spaces. And the idea of our uh, contribution to the project is that we will develop supporting information to bring together um, communities and um, make some of those um, um, uh, different challenges more transparent around land ownership and how you know you can you can uh, do different types of financing models or different types of management uh, uh, environmental management and how you can have different outcomes um, and the idea is that you know we, we can create a process that it's more uh, about informed deliberation um, and also to help to, to give some um, tools for the communities to um, be able to shape um, local priorities for the project and their own economic future. We're hoping to do a workshop later in the year whenever it becomes possible. So, um, sorry, so just the final two slides is just a reminder that obviously we live in this crisis now um, and uh, many of the things that I talk about and um, the things that we look at at NAF um, is never to lose that disconnect um, between uh, the challenges of inequality, the environmental climate challenges, um, and you know how we make uh, decisions about development and economics. Um, and I think this crisis is obviously exposing our system ever more. Um, so if before we already had to do things differently um, because they weren't working or they weren't translating into practice on the ground, um, you know, perhaps there is an opportunity now to have more honest conversations with people um, and, to, um, and to advance some of those changes. And climate change is not going to go away. So the question remains of um, what are we doing now and how are we going to um, uh, invest the resources and time that we have now to ensure that we create that resilience for the future um, for coastal communities. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Uh, really interesting. And I, I don't want, uh, lots of things going through my mind, but I, I don't want to hog the time. So if there's anybody who would like to ask a question, um, please uh, just unmute yourself and start asking your question, hopefully. Um, or, or if you would like to raise your hand so that we can try and do it in a, um, a managed way, that would be great. Or if you'd like to write it on the chat, you could do that too. Fernanda, if you were able to stop sharing your screen, perhaps, then I would be able to, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Keep an eye on the chat and see if anybody is raising their hand and if they would like to say anything.
Have we got any questions? Hi, well, I'm sorry, I've got a question. Brilliant, go um, ahead. Hi, I'm Georgie Sutton from the MMO uh, planning team. And you mentioned there's a need for co-design of economic and social plans that have um, a legitimacy with local authorities. Um, obviously, I'm biased as um, I work on preparing marine plans. Um, but what sort of gap um, are you sort of proposing is filled? Um, as I know, several authorities are um, preparing uh, marine strategies um, and nature strategies. Would that be along the lines of um, a sort of 25 year plan? Um, just, I'd like you to expand more on that if you can. Thanks. Shall I just answer it, Ashton? Um, yeah, thank you, um, Georgie. I think um, what I'm trying to get at is the there is still, um, as I understand, a disconnect between uh, marine plans and um, it, like local economic plans um, in areas, and and then a further disconnect uh, between what these how how like the 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 participation, I guess, of a, a wider um, section of the local community in in shaping and um, supporting and driving those plans. Um, so I guess what I'm proposing, I mean, to give an example from work that NAF does, I'm trying to um, fill that gap, I guess, as you put it, um, is we um, work on community economic development plans. Um, and what that means is that you bring um, different groups within the community, a particular area, obviously normally, you know, a community within a community, um, a particular location, and they go through a process of of workshops that they understand how the local economy works, you know, how money flows in, flows out. Um, and they, they um, the, the, the framework for community economic development is um, to look at social, economic and environmental goals, uh, outcomes, uh, sorry, um, together and to set those um, for, for those plans. And, um, and then they create um, uh, they look at the resources that they have, you know, how they can use those resources um, and uh, and propose basically projects that they want to do in the area. Um, and through, and we've worked with dozens and dozens of communities on that, not just on the coast. Um, and normally what, what, what we've found is that those plans tend to be really strong um, in terms of community participation. Um, they tend to normally uh, different community groups tend to challenge um, ownership, for example, um, of resources locally. Um, so many of these plans have seeked to bring assets um, locally into community ownership, for example, and this does happen. But um, the problem of, of these plans is that they still sit outside of the formal um, structures of how, you know, obviously LEPs, for example, and uh, have quite a lot of the the resources for investment in, 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 in regions and areas, um, but there is no connection between um, those budgets and, you know, those um, more local, locally led community plans. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, I mean, from, from the coast perspective, um, we would really like to see um, more of those kind of processes and that, that bring the coastal and marine planning into the thinking of local communities of how they want to develop their area and how they want to make the most of those assets and then having the legitimacy of these plans um, and the resources um, given to those plans so they can succeed. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, that was helpful, yeah. Thanks, Fernanda and Georgie. And it's a, it's a really important aspect of this actually is bringing all the different types of participants and the types of planning activities together or at least to understand the system in which they all revolve and evolve and um, 
if I'm permitted, and it's a bit cheeky to ask a question when I have the when I have the <laughs> everybody's ears. But uh, w what I'm wondering about is is what was the reaction to the work when you started in Kesingland? What um, what was the reaction from the people running the project, but also the people, the, the local community that were involved? This isn't a planted question. I, 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 I didn't attend any of those workshops, so I, I, I have no idea, but that's the part of it I'm interested in, is that um, the pioneer has been very much about that interaction with those local people. So I'm really interested in, in, in their response. Yes, thank you, Ashley. And it's true, you don't, <laughs> you weren't um, involved in those workshops. So it's a fair question. Um, I must say, like, and, and I just outlined that, I mean, some of the engagement with the community, we're only starting now um, after all this time um, because our priority first was um, to work. I mean, obviously, it's not our project, um, first of all. So we were interested in the project. We thought that you know that's the kind of project that we need to see happening on the coast um <clears throat> and um but you know it still faces some of those barriers i've outlined so our first priority was just to su be supportive of the local partnership um and just work with them and understand from their perspective what what's their ambition for the project um and through the first conversation we immediately agreed <laughs> um, that it would be amazing to be able to explore like a broader vision of a coastal management project, you know, that is not just focusing on the technicalities of a managed realignment scheme, but it's actually allowing for, um, you know, broader questions around like, what do we want this area to look like, you know, for, for what, for um, who's, who's using it and, and how can we maximize um, um, all, those, all those different benefits that can be um, taken from managed realignment scheme. So, um, what I'm trying to say is that I, we understand, and I mean ever more after the conversations with this project, how difficult it is for local partners to, one, create those partnerships and build those relationships. Obviously, like I said, they have to. I mean, it's not, it's not you know, a bad thing or, um, that I'm saying, but you know, obviously you have to engage with the existing landowners. Some of them really receptive to the project and really supportive. Some of them might not be. Um, you know, and, um, and we understand uh, all that. So it's, it's been a slow going in terms of getting to the community because we're also very careful not to start talking to a bunch of local people locally and without, uh, in, in a way that one would interfere or uh, it would go negatively towards, you know, all this partnership and that's very fragile to build but also because you don't want to build expectations. Because as I said, I mean, I think one of the barriers for um, community participation is that people are just fed up with like, you know, being consulted or okay, but what happens and, you know, and promises being made and not being fulfilled. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think we, uh, what was different, I guess, from our um, participation, from what we heard from them in the first couple of workshops with, local officers and different people is, is the um, almost like the, the permission <laughs> because we were there to ask those broader questions, um, to think more broadly like that, to maybe like even on the financing models, like, um, you know, let's say, um, you know, that, that we do want to challenge land ownership in the area. I'm not saying it's the case, but let's say we do because that would be, I mean, it is public money being invested into schemes you know to protect the land um so is there a way that we can think of of, of different models that you know slowly build community um ownership of of different resources for example um and that could potentially aid on um then paying off the costs of the project in the long term um and generating greater benefits and so forth i mean i i won't keep going but i guess that's those are my reflections at this stage, but we're really excited to start engaging the community very soon um, and start asking questions. And we will start by focusing on um, access to, to the space um, and how they use it and how they would like to use it. And I'm, and I'm very interested now because obviously um, with, with this crisis, um, so much 
might have changed in people's um, mind about like, you know, what we do, what we don't do and how we use nature and how we don't. Um, so yeah, it would be really interesting. And I mean, I know as well that um, the area has been hit hard because there's lots of workers there that are not um, considered essential workers. So I'm sure um, the deprivation um, challenge, you know, it's, it's not going to be helped by the crisis. Um, so those are things that we need to be mindful of as well. But I think it just makes it more important that projects like that and all that investment goes towards something that creates larger benefits for the area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernanda. And, um, and I think what's helpful about your answer is that I, I, I know a lot of people on the call and lots of us are involved in a type of partnership or other. So we, we all have this experience of working with other people who might have similar jobs to us, but also then trying to work with local communities and finding a balance amongst all of those things is really tricky and challenging. And, and, and very importantly, you've brought up this point about that it taking time and it, it being really important that you take an approach that is um, sensitive and that is considerate and that is respectful. And often I think we fail to build that time into the things we are doing. And it's a really important point that we think about that, that we think about how we build time in for being sensitive and respectful and considerate. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Lots of silence here. Um, I wasn't coming to ask a question. I was just kind of saying it's like coming towards late afternoon, the day before a bank holiday. So everybody's brains are quiet. Because <laughs> 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 I'm going, I'm on my third webinar of the day and my brains are not working anymore. I'm sure I have got lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Emma, that's a good point then to say that we, um, although in theory this is the end of the pioneer um, and this is some of the wrap up of it, what's great about this work is it will carry on. This is a really good point to, um, to note that uh, interacting with Neff and Fernanda and especially if you're operating around that area in Suffolk, keeping up to date with this project would be a really good idea. So I might ask Fernanda to give some details about how best to do that. My understanding, Fernanda, is that it's the, well, Coastal Partnerships East and the Water Management Alliance who are um, operating the, the bigger project. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So, uh, so uh, 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 keeping in touch with the with um, with the project through them is a great opportunity, but also um, and, and brilliant, Jackie. I was just about to answer your question. So, what we're trying to do is, um, thank, thankfully, Fernanda's made a recording of this, so we'll keep the recording. We're going to share those online with the other resources from the Pioneer. Um, Fernanda is also writing a lesson about what has been learned so far about some of the things that she has said today in her presentation. And that also will be available from the Pioneer. And all of those will be online on the Suffolk Marine Pioneer website and the North Devon Marine Pioneer website. They will be hosting that information. There's lots of information on both those websites already, but this final bits of information will be available um, uh, uh, hopefully in the next, well, certainly in the next six to eight weeks. And if of it course, would be, please, oh, sorry. I was going to say, if it would be helpful, if it would be helpful um, with all those resources and because the Pioneer is coming to an end, if you wanted to do, anybody within the teams had time to do a short blurb um, that could go out in the Marsoc sign newsletter, um, mm -hmm. uh, we could pop that out for you guys if you wanted. It's going out around about the beginning of the third week of every month now we've a comms team who are running that now 
um, and um, so it can be quite flexible. But if that would be useful to kind of get it out to a wider audience, then feel free to send us stuff across and we can disseminate. Great, thank you, Emma. And um, thanks for your nice comment, Jackie, that it's a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation. And I think that that's been, we've tried to make that the thrust really of the pioneer is to, is, is to find these things that are maybe feeling a bit new to some of us and, um, and to maybe stretch um, the, the boundaries a little bit of what um, a lot of us have been focused on for some time. And certainly this aspect of the pioneer, this work that NEF have been doing and a number of interactions that we've had with NEF through the pioneer because um, Fernanda's colleague Chris Williams did some stuff on fisheries for North Devon as well, a really interesting report. And so it, it, it it has definitely stretched our boundaries to think about the economics and the social along with the environmental, which uh, for many of us involved is probably our more natural science to, um, no pun intended, um, for us to be operating with. And this has really helped us to think about that sustainability uh, conundrum um, in the long term. So I, I just just want to say thank you so much to Fernanda for the time that she's given to this and um, and thank, thank you, you all actually. for and can I just say thank you to everyone as well for joining and I appreciate yes. Emma, that it's just before the bank holiday and everyone is probably having <laughs> webinars fatigue um, I'm about to join <laughs> one after this one as well. um, <laughs> but yeah I really appreciate everyone joining and and uh, please let's continue the conversation if anyone has yeah. any um, any thoughts at all even if it's like challenge anything i say or whatever it is like please get in touch um because it's a work in progress absolutely that is uh, that's perfect and um just a, a very small plug since we're talking about lots of webinars i listened into a little bit of the das gupta um webinar earlier today and it, it was really phenomenal and i left i left on purpose i thought actually i need to give this much more uh, focus and I want to be able to listen to the whole lot. I'm going to go back to it and listen to it again. And there's some really key and fantastic points made in that. So um, it was the London School of Economics were, uh, that, that put that webinar on. So it will be good uh, if anybody's interested in these kind of topics to go back to those. And uh, Stephen, thank you very much for saying that it was interesting. And also Jackson, and, and thank you to everybody. Thank you all for, um, for giving us your hour. We really appreciate it. And do stay in touch. Cheers, everyone. Have a great bank holiday weekend. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.